On this week's What the Ship, the supply chain slowdown continues with an outbreak of COVID in China, strikes in South Korea and India, a looming U.S. rail strike. Meanwhile, Maersk and the Federal Maritime Commission are battling each other. The G7 and the EU price cap against Russia may be on hold. The shipping insurance sector is worried about fire, inflation, and climate change. And in the latest battle between the East and West Coasts, we see the rise of the port of Miami. I'm your host, Sam Mercaglano. Welcome to this week's episode. So a lot going on there. That's all of it relevant to you, the consumer, and how any of those five stories are going to impact your daily lives. We're going to make that connection for you right now. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a second, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into story number one. All right, to quote the worst of the Godfather movies, every time I'm out, they pull me back in. That seems to be the case here with COVID. This story from Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7 is talking about the record Chinese COVID cases that are sparking concern. We're seeing an outbreak, a large outbreak, as we're seeing right here in COVID cases. All of these cases have an impact in that we may see lockdowns in Chinese ports. This chart is significant because it shows when Shanghai went into lockdown back in March earlier this year. You can see where it was triggered right here. All of a sudden you have this uh, lockdown here in Shanghai and now we're at an extremely high level. A shutdown in China, a complete lockdown of Chinese ports will have an impact across the entire supply chain. And so that is a concern. We need to be worried about it. At the same time, we're seeing strikes across Korea in two places, one of them in the Hyundai shipyards. We're already seeing a kind of a downturn in shipbuilding as it is. China just reported that they are down in their shipbuilding. But now the Hyundai shipyards in Korea are reporting this, did a whole episode on Korean shipbuilding. And the issue here is the fact that they're bringing in foreign workers into China, excuse me, into Korea to work in the shipyard at a much lower price than the Korean shipyard workers. And also the Koreans are using subcontractors to get away. So sometimes you'll hear people quote about how high the rates are for Korean shipyard shipyard workers are and the fact that they're comparable to American shipyards. Well, when you dig into it and you look at what Korean shipyards are doing, they're doing the same thing that American shipyards are doing in many cases. They're bringing in these casual workers that come in and subcontractors that are much cheaper and disposable in many ways. Same time in South Korea, we have a massive trucking strike that's hitting the major industries. This is going to shut down the ability to get goods to the ports of Busan, for example. This has a impact in the shipment of goods, particularly if China goes into a full-scale lockdown. Meanwhile, over in India, we're seeing the development of a new major port in India. This is the port of Adonai, Uh, in South India, and protesters are blocking construction trucks from coming in. This story was on GCAP and and also over at Maritime Executive, where they're talking about the local opposition to this megaport coming in. India is really unique in that if you look at the top 30 uh, uh, container yards in the the world, uh, container terminals, India isn't ranked at all. Uh, You have one on Sri Lanka, But you don't have one in India, even though there are major shipping routes that go right past India. And so India is trying to get into this game, especially as they see themselves becoming a much bigger player here in world trade. Now you add to the fact, which may be the most significant, is a looming U.S. rail strike. Because we we thought we bit the bullet on this. I posted videos on this when we were talking about the looming rail strike, what this means. But several of the major unions have not agreed to the negotiation that was done. This was the agreement that was done by the Biden administration. And what this could pose is a shutdown in U.S. rail across the country in December. That will have massive impacts on the supply chain and the ability to deliver goods out of ports. Even though we see a lot of cargo shifting to the east and gulf ports, we'll talk about that in a later story, you still need rail to move a great deal of this cargo coming in. Los Angeles and Long Beach still move a heck of a lot of cargo. And without rail, about three quarters of that cargo is not going to be moving. This is a looming potential problem on the horizon. Not to mention the fact we still have the ILWU and the PMA without a contract in the West Coast ports. And so labor found themselves in a very good position during the supply chain crisis. And they're trying to renegotiate their 
agreements with these companies and railway workers in particular have a pretty solid case for themselves because railroads have basically decreased the crews on trains, increased the size of trains. You know, you go from four crew members down to two and you can increase the size of a train from a half a mile long to two miles long. There's an issue there, especially when you get into precision scheduling. All of these have the potential to cause disruptions across the supply chain. And these are the type of issues you should be aware of because one of these expands outward. It has obviously the domino effect down the supply chain. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number two. Story number two pits the Danes against the Federal Maritime Commission. And by the Danes, I mean Maersk. Maersk, the second largest container company in the world, finds itself square in the crosshairs of the Federal Maritime Commission. This story from Nick Savides over at Lodestar is a great example. The Federal Maritime Commission was hacked off from the Maritime Administration back in 1961. It was made an independent commission, five commissioners now. Each commissioner serves for five years, appointed by the president and approved by the Senate, and with one coming on every year. They can't be fired. These five commissioners now have new powers under the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022. This was brought into effect because of a lot of issues that associated with the supply chain crisis. And now what we're seeing is a case being brought against Maersk Lines. And in particular, what we're seeing here is the customer, OJ Commerce, is basically filing a case against Maersk Line and its uh, one of its subsidiaries, a line that it bought up. And basically, they're accusing them of not meeting their contractual obligations and, more importantly, collusion and retaliation against them. So Maersk Lines is in an alliance with Mediterranean Shipping Company. You have the Ocean Alliance and the Alliance. And basically, the argument here is that these alliances are extremely powerful here. And with these alliances basically being unchecked, the set and manipulate rates across the board. Right here, you see the creation of these alliances. Since 2016, in particular, we've seen these alliances form together into pretty powerful entities. The top nine companies control almost 85% of all the container afloat capacity. So you have the 2M Alliance, you have the Alliance, and the Ocean Alliance. The Ocean Alliance made up of CMA, CGM, Uh, You have Costco in there, and then you have Evergreen, and then the alliance with HMM, Hapag Lloyd. Uh, You have the ONE, uh, the grouping together of the Japanese firms all coming together, and Yang Min. So these nine companies, and you could also add Zim in there because Zim is working pretty close in hand with the alliances right now. These alliances are basically orchestrating a lot of manipulation of the system. This is the whole purpose for the Federal Maritime Commission getting this power. And now here you have an entity, you have uh, OJ Commerce basically saying this. And what they're basically saying here is that there was collusion. Now, if you read this part of the story, much of the evidence submitted to the FMC has been redacted in documents made public. And OJ Commerce CEO Jacob Weiss claims this evidence points to a breach of the regulations regarding consortia and could be very embarrassing for certain lines. The court gives very specific criteria for what qualifies for redaction and clearly embarrassing emails do not qualify. This case by OJ OJ Commerce can have the potential to be the one that looms as the case that could break up the alliances. Now, I'm saying that's a really big issue. That's if it goes that way. And I'm not sure it's going to go that way. But the Federal Maritime Commission has been looking for and and kind of an inroad here to make this case. The problem is these are all proprietary agreements. Back in the day, the FMC would publish all this material. It'd be readily available and you can read it. Now that's not the case. This material is redacted. If you go to the FMC website and you pull up the material from this case, you'll just see it. It looks like a, you know, a top secret document from the CIA. You can't read any of it. And this is a problem. Now, the big issue here is can you make the ocean carriers conform to the agreements that they had. And this is the big issue. A lot of these cases are going to be, hey, you made agreements to ship my cargo at this rate. You're not honoring it. You've changed it. 
how do you go about that? And unfortunately, this is a two-way street, too, because a lot of shippers now are canceling their long-term contracts with ocean carriers because the freight rates have fallen so much. And it really comes to a matter of enforcement. How do you enforce these agreements between American who want to ship their cargo and companies like Maersk, which is Danish, and Mediterranean Shipping, which is Swiss and Italian. You know, how do you get these agreements across international lines? Now, if you could show that Maersk and MSC were working together to basically shut out OJ Commerce, that's a whole different issue. And then you go from being an alliance into a cartel, and that has the implications to potentially be the wedge that the FMC would be looking for to break up the alliances. I'm not saying that's what they want to do, but I'm saying that could be the option down the road. And that's why little cases like this are really important to watch. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number three. All right, story number three deals with the G7 and the European Union's price cap on Russian oil. Did a whole video on this too. You can watch it. I'll have it linked above here uh, so you can see there. Here we go right there. So you can watch it. Uh, this case was not surprising when I saw this happen. I, I had a lot of doubts that this is actually going to work. And matter of fact, right after I issued that video, the U.S. Treasury Department came out with guidance on this because one of the reasons was is they were issuing it so late. They, they're just now getting ready to issue the price cap. Cargo is being booked. So, you know, it's hard to change where you're at with cargo already uh, committed on vessels. But what we're seeing right now is the price cap is being seen as not as not being severe enough. This story right here from Bloomberg on G-Captain talks about it. Poland and the Baltic states, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, all feel like that they're being too easy on Russia. And this point right here, the bloc has been locked in a fight over how strict the group of seven lead price cap should be. Pol Poland and the Baltic states are outraged at a proposal to cap Russian oil prices at $65 per barrel limit as the level is above the rates Mo uh, Moscow sells crude now. Poland is demanding additional sanctions, a review mechanism, and a price below the market level, according to a senior diplomat. Okay, why is Pol Poland and the Baltic states upset? This is Ural oil. This is this is the Russian oil. It's selling right now for $62.45 a barrel. That is below the price cap out there. So this does not impact Russia at all. Now, agree, the sanctions go into effect, which is a whole different element. The G7 and the European Union, except for two countries that are that are exempted in the European Union, will still will not buy Russian oil anymore, which means all that Russian oil is going to go somewhere else. But again, it'll go to countries outside the G7, outside the European Union. That means Turkey can still buy it. India can still buy it. China can still buy it. And oh, by the way, they can refine it, turn it into diesel and gasoline, and then sell it to anybody in the G7 and the EU. Because once you launder, I, I mean refine it, not launder. Launder would be an illegal term. Once you refine it, you're laundering it, you basically can sell it back to the G7 and the EU. But obviously Poland thinks that this is way too lenient. You know, there, you know, even if you go to $60 a barrel, that's not much of a hit from where they're selling it in. I should also mention this is pulling down crude oil prices across the board. If you look at WTI crude, you can see how it's been pulled down here, the amount coming down. We've seen that drop coming across. Same thing with Brent crude. We see the same amount here drops across the board with crude oil. This is having an impact because Russia is out there. Now, there are stories that are saying that Russia is not going to be able to do this. This story right here on G-Captain, again, a Reuters story. Russia's tanker fleet too small to bypass the oil price cap. Uh, we talked about this in a previous story we did on the G7 uh, uh, price cap, talking about the ghost fleet, the shadow fleet, whatever you want to call it. But they are building up a fleet to be able to move this. Uh, we see that here with Russia needing to boost its fleet by 157 Aframaxes, 65 Suez Max, and 18 VLCC vessels. We know they're buying vessels like crazy on the open market and putting them under them. The question is, will they be able to do it? We also know that Putin is not backing down on some of this. This story struck me at the same time. This is also on G Captain. Putin touts Russia's Arctic power with launch of nuclear icebreakers. Uh, one of the things that Russia is advocating big time is the Northeast Passage route along the North Shore of Russia. 
offering it as a shorter voyage route between Asia and Europe, bypassing all the maritime choke points that could potentially be blocked, Straits of Gibraltar, Suez Canal, Bab el Mandab, the Straits of Malacca, the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, all of these. And Russia is trying to make itself the alternative here. And with these nuclear icebreakers, by the way, they can take oil and liquefied natural gas from the North Slope, from the uh, Yamal fields, and deliver them directly to Asia without going through the, uh, the Turkish Straits, without going through choke points that could shut them up, and instead take them right through the Bering Sea and into the Pacific and deliver them to India and China bypassing all those routes. This is part of a larger strategy that we see being executed here. And Russia is full bore on this in using the Russia in using the Arctic. They are, you know, whenever given one ashore in the Suez back in March of 2021, 2021, they immediately offered up the Arctic route immediately. And it's just that ocean carriers were not quick to jump on this. But Russia is now going to use this, especially when you hear things like Turkey closing the Turkish Straits unless vessels have insurance. This is an alternative for them to ship oil out via the northern coast of Russia and bypass all the choke points that could potentially shut them up. Again, smart use of ocean shipping. And again, I'm not sure the G7 and the EU are thinking about this far enough in advance to really counter Russian moves. Russia is, is always moving ahead here to ensure this. They need this to sustain their war effort to the detriment of the Ukrainians. All right, let's go ahead and jump to our next story. So one of the hardest challenges in understanding maritime shipping is the intricacies of all the involved parties. And again, when you deal with international shipping, you're dealing with multiple agencies, multiple flags, multiple countries, all the time. So you get something like Ever Given in the Suez. Here's a ship that's working for a Taiwanese company. It's owned by a Japanese company. It's crewed by Indians through a German management company with an American classification society uh, and a Panamanian flag flying from it. And it all happens within the Egyptian waters. Oh, and by the way, the insurance of the vessel is split with the PI, the protection and indemnity in England, and the Holland machinery in Japan. So extremely confusing, but the key point there is insurance. Marine insurance is what makes everything work in the maritime sector. When you have a ship like Ever Given or Ever Forward go aground and they declare general average, this kicks in marine insurance. And the marine insurance business is a very complicated one. There was a great book that came out last year from Hannah Farber, Underwriters of the United States, How Insurance Shaped the American Founding. A great book. I read this book last year. It won the Lyman Prize for Maritime History from the North American Society of Oceanic History, which I'm a member of. Uh, absolutely a fantastic book. Strongly recommend it. It gives you a great insight into the maritime industry. But what I'm talking about today here is a report that came out from Allianz about the issues facing maritime insurance going forward. And the three big things they, they identify are fire, inflation, and climate change. And all three of these should be on everyone's warning. As they say right here, in an analysis of more than 240,000 claims over the past five years, with an approximate value of 9.2 billion euros, fires accounted for 18% of the value of marine claims analyzed. The number of fires on board large vessels has increased significantly in recent years, with a string of incidents involving cargo fires and explosions, which are difficult to extinguish and can lead to the total loss of a vessel, tragic loss of life, and environmental damage. They also note a recent trend of the threat posed by lithium-ion batteries in electrical vehicles or cargo that is not stored, handled, or transported correctly. So lithium-ion batteries, and again, you got the image here in this story of Felicity Ace burning out in the Atlantic. Uh, this was caused probably by a lithium-ion battery on a vessel. Understand, lithium uh, car fires today, I'm, I've been a volunteer firefighter for 25 years now. Let me tell you the difference between a normal car fire and a lithium-ion fire. Normal car fire burns at about 1,500 degrees. You can put it out with about 1,000 gallons of water. A lithium ion, an EV car, burns at 5,000 degrees, and you need 40,000 gallons of water to put it out. Huge, massive 
problem because of the amount of energy that's dumped out of it. And it causes fires that cannot be extinguished easily, let alone when you're parked bumper to bumper on a car deck on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, the cargo storage, another big one, Express Pearl off of Sri Lanka, classic example where we saw in uh, a cargo improperly stored, break loose, unable to find a port of refuge. Oman and, and India refused that vessel to come in to handle it. And what we had was a massive fire on board that led not only to the loss of the ship, but to a massive uh, environmental uh, disaster that took place. Uh, you see right here, we see more high value goods being shipped by container while the average cost of goods rises with inflation. It's not unusual to see one container valued at $50 million or more for high value cargoes like pharmaceuticals. Think about that for a second with cargo container loss and cargo container damage. Cargo values have risen noticeably in the past year. We recently saw a truck fire loss involving a cargo valued at $73 million from just one transportation. This is a concerning trend for marine underwriters. If you're going to insure vessels, especially large container vessels, vessels over 20,000 boxes, you know, improperly storing one container load could conceivably lead to the loss of that entire vessel. And you're talking about billions of dollars of loss at the time. See right here, the trend is for larger ships is also helping increase supply chain exposures. Larger vessels, while more efficient, require port infrastructure and logistic support that is more complex and specialist than traditional shipping. This also raises the issue of cyber attack. It raises the issue of environmental issues as water rises or lowers. Uh, you have issues with dredging in, in the ports. If you have flooding, you can't get under bridges. All of this has an issue. It goes on down here. National catastrophes were already the fifth biggest cause of marine insurance claims by both frequency and severity for the five-year period ending December 2021. Extreme weather and natural hazards have contributed to a number of large losses in the past. With the loss of vessels and damage to cargoes, extreme weather was a contributing factor in at least 75% of the total losses reported in 2021 alone. You know, three issues, which are not unusual at all, fire, inflation, and climate change, that's, that's not unusual, but they're having a greater impact as we make ships bigger, as we, we increase the rate of the supply chain, having ships move faster. All of that raises the concern of damage, which means that the insurance for these vessels gets more and more expensive. Again, you know, if you have a kid, you know what I'm talking about here, how much it is to get a child insurance for a car, you know how expensive that can be. And what we're seeing here is insurance prices rise and insurance prices get pushed onto the shipper. You're paying more to ship the goods. So while you may see freight rates coming down, for example, that sounds great, but your insurance for that freight may be increasing. And that could be a big concern as we go forward, especially as we see more and more of these accidents begin to happen, because as these accident rates increase, the insurance rates go up with it. All right, let's go ahead and jump to our last story. All right, last story deals with the topic of the shift of cargo from the West Coast of the United States to the East Coast of the United States. Again, done videos on this, talked about this a lot. This is not new. We, we all saw this happening. It goes with the end of the backlog of ships off Los Angeles and have now moved to ports like Houston, Savannah, and New York, New Jersey. This story from Greg Miller talks about this, how L.A. is finding itself losing ground to the East Coast. Same time, you get this story also in Freight Waves. Uh, Gulf Coast ports continue to see rising volumes in October. And the story I wanted to raise was one I saw in Maritime Executive, because I think it's a really interesting perspective of this. We've talked about a couple of ports like crazy here, but here's a port I haven't talked about. And this is the port of Miami down in Florida. So if you remember during the height of the supply chain crisis, both uh, Governor Abbott in Texas and Governor DeSantis in Florida announced, hey, L.A. traffic, come to Texas and Florida, our ports are open. So we know they went to Texas. We know Houston has benefited from this. Florida, not so much. And, and there was a couple of reasons why Florida did not get the cargo immediately. Number one was they couldn't handle some of the vessels in question. There was a question about the infrastructure on the ground, uh, cranes, uh, draft getting in the ports, 
the uh, routing of the vessels? Do you really want to send ships into Miami with a lot of cargo? Because then you're at the bottom of my of Florida, the very southern tip of Florida. If you need to get into the other 47 states, it's a long haul out of Florida. If you ever driven Florida, you know how long Florida is. That's a big issue. But this story right here talks about the fact that the Port of Miami is seeing an uptick with the arrival of the largest ship to date, which is a CMA CGM container ship. And you see right here that uh, the Port of Miami, which is a cruise capital, if you ever go into Miami, is a cruise capital. But one of the things you saw was on November 17th, the CMA CGM Osiris, 156,000 deadweight tons, became the largest ship to come into the port. And this vessel is a massive vessel. If you look at it, it is a 15,536 TEU ship. Now, TEUs are 20-foot equivalent units. This doesn't mean the ship carried 15,536 boxes because many of these containers are 40-footers. So it takes two TEUs to make one FEU. But what's interesting here is the route. It is operating currently on a route between Korea, China, via the Panama Canal through that new lane, of the Panama Canal, that Neo Panamax lane that opened in 2016 and is calling at New York, Charleston, Savannah, and Miami. Expected to move over a thousand containers through the Southern Florida Container Terminal. So notice, this is the key thing here. So not a lot of containers coming off. I mean, you're talking about 5%, less than, a little more than 5% of the containers probably coming off, maybe 10% when you, when you get them into FEUs. But what you're seeing here is how on the East Coast, they're much different than the West Coast. West Coast, almost 80 to 100% of the cargo comes off in LA or Long Beach. Whereas on the West, East Coast, you're taking off maybe about 10 to 20% of the cargo at the ports. You're taking off smaller slices of this. And in particular, what you're doing is lo offloading 1,000 containers that is targeted for Southern Florida or Florida in general. And you see CMA, CGM doing that. They're bringing in vessels of this. Uh, you see right here, Port of Miami has serviced three of the largest CMA, CGM vessels, the Argentina, the Magellan, and the Christopher Columbus. All of these are big ships that made the, uh, the routes. And, you know, what we're seeing is the Port of Miami is growing. It went from 1 million TEUs over the past six years to last year, 1.2 million TEUs. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot when you deal like with ports of L.A. and New York, New Jersey that handle almost 10 million TEUs. But that's a 20 percent increase. That is a substantial increase. And the Port of Florida has the potential here to really see themselves grow. I think that small, medium-sized ports, and, and I would call Miami a definite medium-sized port here, has the potential to grow. Jacksonville, Tampa, uh, all those ports in Florida have that potential to see this type of growth. They have to start getting themselves orchestrated, bring in the freight forwarders, bring in the distribution centers so that they can handle this influx of containers coming in. Unfortunately, you just can't sit there and say your ports are open and expect the container ships to come in. What you do see here is the ports taking advantage of it. This is the end result of this call when Governor DeSantis and Governor Abbott in Florida and Texas made this offer. You see it coming to fruition. And so uh, Mediterranean Shipping Company, which is now the largest shipping co company in the world. And if you can recruit companies like this to come into your state and into your ports, you can see the growth manifest itself. So five stories across the, the maritime spectrum, a lot going on, obviously. So when we joked about in our last video that the supply chain crisis was over, obviously it's not. There's a lot to be paying attention to. Just because we're down from the Mount Everest of 2021-2022 rates, let's remember 2029, 2019 was the highest prior to that. So we're still at a pretty high level. And so we have to be thinking about the fact that we're seeing freight move at an extraordinary level of, of commerce right now. There is still potential with a recession on the horizon. Inflation is hitting. We've got issues with oil availability and diesel fuel. IMO 2023 is going to go into effect soon, which is going to slow down vessels. It's going to make the supply chain even slower coming across the ocean, which means you need more vessels in that mix. Ocean carriers want to get the freight rates back up. They don't want to be at pre-COVID levels, so they're going to do everything they can to manipulate the system. There is a lot going on. And the way you can keep informed about that is tune in to this channel and our weekly broadcast of What the Ship. We 
have features during the week, two to three during the week on specific aspects of the shipping industry and also some history uh, perspectives that I like to float out here and there. So if you're new to the channel, hey, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the channel. How do you do that? Well, you can hit that super thanks button down below, which allows you to contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon. You'll see a link at the very end of the video or down in the show notes there, and you can contribute to the page by becoming a patron either monthly or yearly. I appreciate all the support I get. Got an episode coming out here at the 1st of December for my patron uh, patrons who uh, basically submitted questions to me that I'm going to answer directly for them in a live episode. Until our next episode, this is Sal, signing off.